Defence Report for the 4th week of September 2020. This week, out of 64 RPGs eager for the top spot, only 32 remain. But which of them will survive? Round 2! The Adventure Party, discussing tabletop radio gaming the Irish way. Hello and welcome to the party. I'm Gavin. And we have with us our yep. excellent co-hosts. Yes, I am a very excellent co-host who didn't uh, run right over our uh, main host's uh, words today. I am Shane, also known as Scar, by people who th- for some reason think I'm some form of Barbarian King. You're the one true Barbarian King of the Disgruntled Legions, my old friend Scar. And here we are on the field of battle once again. It is I, Savage Mick. And we are going into another bracket fight. So I've 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 said they are excellent co-hosts, but they've been doing some very <laughs> unexcellent things. I've been called from the field of battle on the front lines to redress their great uh, crimes against RPGs and to do some crimes against RPGs of my own. Uh, for those crimes. who don't know, we are currently going through all of the beloved RPGs that have existed and taking them out one by one till only one stands. If you are interested in uh, catching up on this, we'll have links to the previous episodes. Just so you know, uh, the 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 terrible things that have been done, and you can get angry at our choices leading up to our new choices now. Which will also make you angry. Oh yes, absolutely. What won't make any of you angry is to know that I've taken upon myself to procure some libations for this evening. I'm going to crack open a lovely bottle of something called O'Hara's Tropical IPA, which is about as appealing to some of you as porridge and orange juice in the same bowl. But for us seasoned and somewhat jaded drinkers, uh, something that has both tangerine, mango, and stone fruits, and uh, an alcohol volume of 7.2 percent uh it is sure to be something of a treat so here we go that came off nice and easy i'm gonna pour out a pint of this while uh scar perhaps you could explain to us the criteria by which these uh, combatants were chosen well that this was an arduous process of uh four extremely overdone episodes of going through the top 64 RPGs as determined by the number of people who play them on uh, Roll20 and like I think it was March or February I did this because I was we, our initial idea was that it would be our March Madness episodes and then it ballooned into a, a thing that was taking us most of 2020 to get through in our defense, yeah. though, the, the March did seem to also trail on in a never-ending spiral of despair and time. What's like 2020 itself? Um, but yes, this is these are the first of the round two episodes where we go. We have narrowed the 64 man start, the 64 RPGs uh, start down to 32. We're going to cover 16 of those uh, round one survivors today uh, and bring, uh, in eight pairings and thankfully we've managed to do this while all of the responsible party members are off doing silly things like gaming or watching uh, real sports or you know being with their families and uh, thus no one can stop us from getting this done uh, in a reasonable time with our unreasonable opinions Absolutely. Every single one of these are born survivors. They have the blood of another RPG on their hands, and they've stepped across those corpses into the next circle of the winner's bracket to deliver some beatdowns on an epic scale. We've discarded with all the chaff. What we have here are some of the best of the best, but we're going to whittle a little finer. We're going to cut through muscle and sinew. We're going down to bone. So, who do we first? Uh, okay, well, sure. Uh, round one of round two. The first pairing uh, is the initial survivor of round one. Pathfinder, second edition. Uh, the joys of the random generator put this at the start, and it managed to beat off the classic Traveller. Um, but it is now up against uh, Rune Quest, the classic... 
Um, you can have a fantasy world, but also have it be interesting and full of role play game uh, of what's his name? Well, I remember it's set in Glorantha. Oh, the guy died. Why I feel so terrible for not remembering his name. You're probably thinking of Greg Stafford. Yes, Mr. Stafford has been quite the uh, stalwart of the industry for decades, and uh, we're, we're very sad to hear of his passing. Um, but uh, fortunately, we have to put his um, old veteran uh, Never Say Die RPG up against the brand new whippersnapper of path, uh, a mechanically optimized uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So, who wants to start us off? Yeah, Greg, Greg had a, a long and storied career stretching from the 70s uh, right up into the... Uh, the, probably, possibly even the early 2000s. I think he, he did some work with I'm sure Mongoose. he was working on the latest edition of Pendragon before he died. I'm pretty sure um, like it went to print yes. as he was on his deathbed, which is horribly morbid. <laughs> it, it does happen. Many, many a fine creator has have, have not lived to see the final fruitions of their, uh, their masterpiece, their Opus Magnus. But... Uh, he was a, a fine designer of games who obviously saw a lot of change in the, the industry. But we're not going to allow platitudes and honorifics uh, and fine feeling to colour our, uh, our opinions and decision making here, are we? Are we that easily swayed? I mean, we get swayed by literally every other thing. <laughs> Cold, <laughs> hard comparison and murder. We will, we will kill one RPG this day. And I, I, I eight of them. Greg, Greg has Greg has an awful lot of of opportunities here because he was also involved uh, very heavily with things like Pendragon, which also appears later on in the in the rankings. Gavin, you've got your knives out. I, I want to start off not uh, not uh, you know Rune Quests. I I have no great feeling toward it one way or the other. You know, we, uh, I understand it's an old system. It, it set up a lot of things, but to me, it, it, it is ephemera. I want to talk about Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And I want to talk about how terrible Pathfinder 2nd Edition is. <laughs> stack Pathfinder 2nd Edition against any, any other uh, RPG. You could stick it there out of positive or negative. Pathfinder 2nd Edition does not deserve to make it to round two. Pathfinder 2nd Edition doesn't even deserve to be on this bracket. The only reason it's there is because it, because of a, a, a carrying on legacy of a much better, much more popular game. If you released Pathfinder 2 without its association as an individual RPG, it would have, you know, been buried at the bottom of DM's Guild months ago. Now, much has been talked about of Pathfinder 2nd uh, Edition on this very podcast, much positives, but I feel that is under, um, valuing the, the, the true darkness that is Pathfinder 2nd Edition. It is a, has a mediocre combat system. It tried some new things, but the new things didn't try very well. You know, it it, 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 it has closed off advancement from a previous RPG that, that, you know, all the new content is coming out under the lens of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which, you know, has, has really turned opinion against it even more. I, I would I would decry its 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 merits as an RPG on its own. I, I admit it did try some new things and innovation is how you um how you you know make it in this in the games industry and with RPGs and many many on this list are very innovative but you know the innovation needs to be good innovation Pathfinder Second Edition was not good innovation. Okay, quick question: Did you uh, did you buy everything for Pathfinder First Edition? Is it no longer compatible? Is that the uh, that the root I... of your ire? No, no. Now I do have a, a great fondness for the, the 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 story and lore of Pathfinder First Edition, but I'm not going to um, not going to play Pathfinder Second Edition to find out how things occur. <laughs> well, right. So, well, I think we know how Gavin feels about that. Um, <laughs> okay. Yikes. <laughs> anything? Uh, anything to to stay the the executioner's axe. Wow. Um, oof. This. Uh, now, Don't course, tell now me it's a difficult decision. <laughs> it, it, it's not the most difficult decision, but it is one that fills me with regrets. Um, I've played Pathfinder Second Edition. I've bought a copy of Pathfinder Second Edition. Pathfinder Second Edition 
is definitely what I would go to if I want that mechanically crunchy um, tactical RPG feel. You know, if I wanted to you do do something in the Pathfinder 3.5 or 4th Ed vein, I would go to Pathfinder 2nd Edition first, I think. But it feels really mean to be beating on RuneQuest, which, as we said, is one of the formative, imaginative uh, games that has stuck with us for so long. The problem is I, I just don't see myself running to RuneQuest as quickly I as I would run to uh, Pathfinder. And it's difficult to re-articulate why that would be, but I suspect it's sort of a feeling of intimidation. Like, even before Mr. Stafford forcibly left us, RuneQuest really did feel like this labour of love and a labour that was sort of complete in and of itself. It was like, if you were going to play RuneQuest or Hero HeroQuest or whatever uh, name it was using at the time, it was because you wanted that specific experience, that Kings of Dragon past, Bronze Age uh, feeling, getting away from the knights and uh, and the and the you know wizards and into the this realm where myth was real, where time was fluctuated based on the actions of heroes. And while that's really amazing and evocative. It can be a bit harder to approach than something like Pathfinder, which has always had its benefits in, well, yes, we have a setting, we have our adventure paths, but this is a toolbox game that you can apply to so many different game types, um, and you can use it anywhere. And I think that's ultimately Pathfinder's big strength in this matchup, is that it's... It's this large, well, robust mechanical system for running lots of different kinds of fantasy, while RuneQuest is this bespoke, artistic, and really well done system for running itself. And uh, unfortunately, though it, it saddens my heart, I think I have to go with Pathfinder in this matchup. Uh, right. <clears throat> I won't hold it against you for too long. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think there's there's much to be said for each and either of them. The one is obviously a little fresher than the other. Uh, the the latter longer in the tooth, more storied. Has been through, like when we talk about RuneQuest, systematically we're talking about a whole bunch of different versions of of the rules. Uh, so I think we have to side with uh, its setting. And the idea is that that kind of holds if we're going to judge the game as a whole. The rules have varied uh, between percentile systems and kind of there's been sort of a war gamesy style thing. There's some there was very... a, a version in like the late twenty ten uh, twenty the late aughties uh, or noughties, uh which was D twenty based but like D twenty roll under. I have copies somewhere in my attic. That I found at Galcon. It looked interesting, but but see, but see, Pathfinder Second Edition is, to my mind, a very good rendering down of some of the uh, some of the core ideas behind three point five, and has and has of this edition innovated in ways that I think are incredibly interesting. As much as Gavin perhaps doesn't like things like the shield rule or the action point <laughs> economy being spelled out in in very uh, explicit ways. Uh, and I'm, I'm supposing what Gavin doesn't like. I shouldn't do that, but I just did it. So there, uh, I I think Pathfinder is on much sounder mechanical footing. I have a note here in front of me uh, when I was kind of judging these uh, these matchups, and it says Galorian versus Glorantha. Uh, who stole more? Uh, it's, that's the problem for me. I'm I largely go with uh, settings over systems. And RuneQuest has a great setting. I think the Dragon Pass uh, aspects of it are fantastic, but the Duck People stuff is where it kind of falls down for me. So there's there's good and bad in there. Pathfinder hasn't had as much time to establish a setting, although it is much more coherent 
if perhaps a little bland in places, although I do love goblins, and I do love the fact that they get songs. More songs in role-playing games, please. That is, um, I, I will I will jump, if you will pardon me, to on. the defense of Pathfinder 2nd Edition and Pathfinder in general in that regard. It, it, it's new nature, as you said, um, you the world at once. Whereas with a lot of D and D and with a lot of other systems, a lot has changed. There's you know broken canon, different things that seem real and not real. The fact that Pathfinder is is newer, and the fact that Pathfinder was better designed, its world was sort of fleshed out and more cohesive from the beginning. You get a greater sense of the world that it is and. That, that it feels like a cohesive world and it feels a lot more engaging as a result. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I think I have to throw I have to throw the dice here now and say no sorry. Don't worry, I'm not throwing dice. I'm not gonna We get endless complaints about the dice. I know, I'm not gonna give up my agency. I have to make a very <laughs> difficult decision. Um Damn my eyes, I think RuneQuest has run its course. Unfortunately, it is it is complete. It is it's it is done. It is uh, a jewel to be turned over and beheld from all sides. But I think there's yards ahead of Pathfinder Second Edition. It is space to grow. I think it can still surprise us uh, and find a way to uh, give uh, first of all it occupies ironically the same space that RuneQuest occupied in the market all those years ago the second most popular fantasy role playing game it is a necessary counter to the design choices made in 4th and 5th ed it is going to continue to to be a haven for people who feel that the big dog has sort of left them out in the cold uh, it is a ship I want to see sailing into the future. So I, ah, despite the fact that I just don't love the setting as much as I I love RuneQuest setting, I'm going to give it to Pathfinder. Right. What? So who who won there? That would be Pathfinder two to one. Okay. So it carries through. Can't believe I did that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it feels a little mean, but uh, we have to go with the the horrible mix and mulchiness of our head and heart together. And don't worry, Gavin, you'll find you'll find me a passionate ally in other uh, battlefields yeah. because I loved your evisceration at the start <laughs> there. <laughs> I, I, I just this is this is not a a, a battle but a war. There a you war go for the soul of RPGs. <laughs> okay, let's All crack right. on with the next one. Give All us right, a brief one. intro is uh, Star Wars Fantasy Flight Edition versus L5R, another Fantasy Flight property now. Um, mm. So this is... Uh, this is, And I think they use similar enough systems, or, or at least... Uh, I understand that they're both their own take on what uh, uh, became Genesis, even though they have their own differences to make, for their own thing. That's, that's my understanding. I may be off base there. Yeah, they're... they're- there, there are the, in the latest editions of 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 these. Now, L five four did start off under a, a a different system, but in the latest editions under Fantasy Flight, they do share uh, there for a few differences, but they do share a a common uh, mechanical um, framework. Hmm. In this case, I think once again the setting is going to be one of the big uh, elements here. This is the Fantasy Flight version. I think I really like what FFG did with the Genesis system and how they introduced it in Star Wars because the light and the dark gave a, a very good sort of thematic framework for how the, the dice rolling worked. Um, I have a bit of an on-off relationship with L5R in all of its iterations. I, I know it by its setting very well. I know it by its card game uh, slightly and by its... Uh, RPGs almost not at all. Uh, for me, it's it's going to be Star Wars FFG through familiarity, and um, I suppose they're they're both mired in in difficulties uh, ethically. <laughs> but I I do like the Star Wars setting uh, f- for the most part. So uh, FFG for me, Star Wars. Gavin, we're going to put uh, me in the spot. Yeah, uh-huh. um, I. <laughs> 
I I am going to to also have to go with Star Wars there for for slightly different reasons. I think they're both interesting settings. I you know I, Star Wars is a great world, but like the specifics of the Final Fantasy RPG of you know Star Wars is it, it is very unique in its representation of your character and it it, it is mechanically represented there uh, and i um you you play you know various different you know one of three groups but you you still have that 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 sort of adventure and you know I, i've seen online it is and, and and discussions and and i'm of the opinion that it is the best representation um of playing in that world of playing in star wars than any other sort of um, um, licensed game, the the mechanics make you feel like you're playing a Star Wars game, um, uh, and and it's because of Star Wars that you know L five or mechanically is is what it is now, and it it will continue to to, to go um, forward because of the strength of how Star Wars the FFG. Um, was done. Hmm. Well, I'm very sorry to all of the people I know who, you know, love Alpha with the passion and own katanas. Uh, but I, I'm afraid I have to go with Star Wars as well. Um, although in my case, it's partly for the reasons that, uh, uh Mick and Gavin have suggested, but, uh, it's also because I'm looking at the list right now and I know that in a few rounds I'm going to have to make another similar decision and I'd rather make it here than in uh, uh, another place. So I'm going to say for me, just looking at these two games, L5R has always been interesting but it always has this element of intimidation. Um, I know that the fantasy fight system is good enough to express it and that, but I feel like if it was between these two games, I would gravitate to Star Wars because I've I've actually never had a proper Star Wars RPG experience, despite it being a staple of the industry for basically nine, you know, forty years. I've just never had a chance to sit down in a campaign of Star Wars and play it. Possibly because people like Savage were uh, hogging the major Star Wars DM at the time. For uh, well, how long did that campaign last? Seven years? Well, there was a few campaigns, but they they went on a while. I think we got we we broached ten in the end. Yeah. Well, listen, hold on a second. Don't sling any mud in my direction, Scar. You're the one who's so nakedly playing the meta game here as you look down the bracket. Um, before you hear this episode, folks, uh, we should have released. Uh, these matchups to give you a chance to speculate wildly. So uh, unfortunately, we have to exist in the past where we don't get to see your own takes on this, but we would be interested in hearing from you uh, in the comment section uh, on our Discord uh, once this episode airs so you can tell us what you really think. So that's a clean sweep for Star Wars uh, Fantasy Flight Games Edition. Yeah. Let us All plow right. on. Next one up is uh, Savage Worlds Versus another Greg Stafford game, King Arthur Pendragon. Oh boy! Uh, so we need to give we need to give Gavin the swing on this one. So how about uh, I go actually, first? Actually, yeah, Gavin, what do you know of the no, 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 Pendragon? We need, to, we need to give Gavin the decider on this one. So oh, he has to go that's last. Fair. That's so fair. We'll, we'll rotate through it in an unequal and un, ultimately unsatisfying way. I went last as la- last. So it's my turn, I time. believe. I said no. No, you didn't. What? <laughs> Anyways, this, Savage Worlds this is an versus emotional Pendragon. Fight. Uh, while while Scar is mired in confusion, I will take the take the lead, take the reins. Um, Savage Worlds. I've already. It's on my shelf here. I can, I can reach out and touch it. Uh, it is very adaptable, uh, very uh, concise, very easy to run. Uh, mechanically, it quite suits uh, my style. I love the exploding dice. I love the the power it gives players. I I like the uh, that it's then asked them to trade off some of the power with some quirks and flaws. I feel that these are it, it mechanically supports making sort of interesting four color characters in, with which to play an exciting game. Pendragon is very much it does one thing and it does one thing only. It uh, purports to take you through the uh, 
the grandeur of an Arthurian legend, uh, a romance in the age of chivalry. I haven't played it. I uh, I understand on an intellectual level that is very well regarded. Uh, it doesn't actually exist in a place that I'm terribly interested in. And don't mistake that for me being some of, oh, why can't I play a female knight? Or why can't I play uh, someone who's sort of a, a commoner who will arise to, to greatness? It's, it's not that I don't appreciate what Pendragon does, just it's not actually something that's going to push my buttons. Uh, so... Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go with the the fit young contender here in Savage Worlds and very quickly post my colors to the mast before we move on to Scar. I've always been curious about Pendragon. I've always it's always been this really interesting point of this idea of this mix between historical accuracy, fantasy gaming um, requirement, and you know adherence to the source where. It's partly Mallory, but it's also partly Stafford's uh, obsession with like post Roman uh, post Roman Britain. It's it's always just had this real appeal, and it's all as this lighthouse that I've, uh, I I keep looking out to see if I can you know learn more about and maybe someday understand is the is the Great Pendragon campaign something that I could run someday. But honestly if I did, I suspect uh, I would be very tempted to run it in Savage Worlds. Um, oh. <laughs> Savage Worlds is, uh, is uh, has been a stalwart of my gaming collection since I got um, I believe I first purchased the revised edition uh, in around 2005-2006 and various editions have since then become just my go-to toolbox game i i've never felt i needed to apologize for doing that because while it's certainly not the perfect system it is very good at what i it purports to do to to create a fast moving uh game where you can just throw it at people uh, at people explain it in five minutes and work through scenario that you come came together with uh at l- over lunch break and just have fun with and well yeah pendragon has always been this lighthouse this this guiding star in the in my pretensions of being a artsy gamer the truth is that i've uh rumbled in the muck with savage worlds too much to abandon her now uh, and i'm very sorry to mr stafford and all of his amazing works, but I, I think I have to go with Savage Worlds once again. So, Gavin, now that your vote doesn't matter, how do you want to vote? <laughs> well, I was going to say, do, this is your opportunity to try and sway us. We have been known to change our votes oh, before. that's a fair point. That's a fair point. So, make the most impassioned argument you might in, in favor of whomever you favor. So, my players will know that I am a fan of the long campaign. You know, to me, role-playing games isn't just about, um, you know, telling a quick story, about having a quick adventure. It's about characters and how characters learn and grow and change. And Pendragon is a reflection of that. You, you know, it's, it's an experience that you can have once, but what an experience. You have this character, these characters who, you know, grow as the game progresses, who change who, who change the world, who shape it, and you feel the weight and length of that action. But to me, when I was first introduced to the wonderful world of, you know, of specialty RPGs, of, of, of gaming and gaming as a, a whole, was through the convention scene. And it was through the lens of Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds to me is the perfect game. If you want to run a game, tell a story. As wild as crazy it is, you know, I turn to Savage Worlds as as a way of of getting that across. It is, it is a a generic system, but you can tell so many genres in it. I'm not here to change your minds. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, Savage Worlds to me is, is what encapsulates the perfectness that is RPGs. And it, 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 it shows to me, you know, 
the RPGs are about community and uh, the fun memories I have in Savage Worlds will stay with me for you know, the rest of my life. I just like just this morning we got angry letters about all of our choices uh, <laughs> a, a, about these bracket fights and we're just proving them 100% right. Um, so yes, that's another clean sweep. Uh, hey, so I, I stopped listening out. We got letters. I'm just delighted to get correspondence. Uh, <laughs> thank you for sending in your thoughts and opinions on the show. We'd love to hear uh, from more of you. Yes, please continue to complain about how we're not changing at all. No, <laughs> that, 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 it is it is taken on board. Believe us, dear listeners, it's taken on board, and we do uh, we do pay attention. We do discuss the points that are brought up. Not everything is possibly going to be acted upon. We have our own sort of set of core values to which we remain true, but we are interested in hearing what you like and dislike. Uh, so thank you always for uh, for sending in your thoughts on uh, on the show. Um, that brings us on to the next bracket, doesn't it? Yes, We're cracking it does. through these boys. Look at this. We're rattling yeah. through them, eviscerating the ranks. Uh, a little bit. Well, okay. Who's next? So Next up uh, is Seminar Classic, Call of Cthulhu versus slightly less classic, Exalted, the game of anime punch wizards. <laughs> um, so, what I cosmic think we throw, do people want to express today? I think we have to throw back to Gavin again, do we? Possibly. Yes, let's. For me, it's it has to be Call of Cthulhu. Uh, I I I I see what Exalted is doing, and I I feel you know maybe if I, I might want to engage with with that, but uh, you know, I to me RPGs are all about storytelling, and Call of Cthulhu is a great way to tell interesting mysteries, stories about you know, um, fear and hard. Some of the the times when I've frightened players the most is playing Call of Cthulhu. And it, when you get that reaction out of a player, you know, that, that sort of tells you all you can. Uh, but it, it is a game that is, is mechanically interesting, mechanically sound, and has a deep history and some great campaigns out there. There are some amazing um, uh, campaigns that have stood the test of time and been updated uh, in Call of Cthulhu that, that I would recommend you checking out. Either um, uh, uh, the, the, the one that comes most to mind is uh, Mask of Nyarlathep, a, a, a world-spanning adventure. That, and, and Call of Duty is great for either playing pre-written stuff, there's amazing stuff out there, or coming up with your own stuff, your own horror. You, can, you, know, you don't have to be shackled to the, the, the mythos. You can use it to tell uh, interesting horror stories. And, that, that, and that's why I'm picking Call of Cthulhu. Okay. Not even um, a word to be said about Exalted. Such dismissiveness is so refreshingly uh, <laughs> vicious. Who's next? Is it I'll me? go next, I okay. guess. Um, so, as previously stated uh, the last time this came around, I've never been able to get onto the Cthulhu vibe. I've never been able to get into the headspace of personal horror and cosmic horror as things that click for me um i understand the appeal i understand the 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 process of you know working through your fears and your existential dread through the safe realms of role playing but i've just never been able to get into that headspace and so cthulhu i'm not saying i'm the guy that they made plushy cthulhu for but i'm i'm sort of the guy who can consider a, a tense Cthulhu board game of psychological horror and plushy Cthulhu to be on a similar, both valid takes on the same material. So it's not so much that I dislike Call of Cthulhu, it's a perfectly functional system, but the things that make it unique and uh, really make it sing as an RPG don't appeal to me as much as they do to so many other people. So, unfortunately, I have to dissent and go with Exalted, which is a understandably flawed uh, game uh, that basically requires uh, any GM or storytelling group to take the scissor to it, edit out a whole bunch of questionable nonsense, and uh, focus in on what they and their characters love. And, of course, to house rule the bejesus out of 
a whole bunch of interesting combinations of crazy anime powers. Um, but Cthulhu is a as a challenge in where's the fun. Uh, Exalt is a challenge in order to crystallize fun out of it. It's putting fun into a stone as opposed to squeezing it out of a sponge. Uh, a sponge that might have a few uh, stray sticks and the occasional rose thorn in. That okay. This analogy is gone. Uh, it is it's just, it's just oh, been... what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Unraveled by the cosmic chewing of <laughs> the, the thing is, basically, I can see myself running an exalted game and getting some good at it. I'm not sure what system we'll end up using. It might be Savage Worlds, um, <laughs> but yeah, I definitely uh, more gravitate to exalted, and that is entirely a personal bias, which is unfortunately going to be co- I'm reject a fact uh, in this uh, weird voting system that we have. There you go. Measurable biases. Um, I think I've, I spoke very colourfully about Exalted uh, when it came up in the first round, um, but that cannot overshadow the fact that I really haven't had much exposure to it. Call of Cthulhu, I've been in and out of one-shots, uh, brief campaigns. I I, rem- I still have to play one of the Grand Dam uh, scenarios or, or campaigns that Call of Duty is so famed for, but I recognize it as being very good in the moment as well. I think there are very few RPG settings and systems that do well on both those fronts. And while I appreciate that Exalted exists because it serves a particular need... Uh, it, alongside things like Feng Shui, uh, help to help players to explore that kind of uh, four-color, uh, guttered and anime-streaked uh, space in gaming. I'm a I'm a gamer of the Western wor- mold first and foremost, and Call of Cthulhu is a foundational text for a genre head like me. I I it doesn't hurt, of course. That I absolutely love horror as a genre. Uh, Cthulhu was the first place I encountered mechanics for psychological damage or madness, and it always kind of struck me that uh, this was a great additional thing to worry about uh, for players. So I am going to give it to Call of Cthulhu by a fairly substantial yard. Fair, fair. So I believe that brings it, us to 2 1 in Cthulhu's favour. Yep. Who has taken it? It's almost like having an, e- uh, an odd number of participants. In these episodes uh, makes the voting process simpler. It's uh, it's not yeah, it's not desperately hard to to pick out some of the winners here. Uh, there's we are still hitting what I feel are slightly uneven matchups uh, based on the the legacy and and staying power of some of these. So we're definitely destroying all credentials that we have of being artsy because we are tending to <laughs> go for the more pedigree, most... more, more, yeah. uh, there will be lost. opportunities for if you're, being, if you're being generous, we're going for the more flexible, um, anyone can use this, uh, options over the bespoke single experience ones. Uh, that's, well, that's very telling, isn't it? Um, now this is, of course, this we've see, we've slid straight into halftime analysis. But I'm going to interrupt that by calling out, uh, g- giving a, a wholehearted and full-throated appreciation for uh, something from the stuff from our friends thread that we run on our Discord. Uh, stuff from our friends is a place we have opened up that we invite all and any of you who've got something gaming related to share. To come and share it. Uh, we just had here in, in Ireland, we just had Culture Night 2020, which is usually a night for people to bunk off work uh, a little early, usually midweek, uh, head for uh, some arts or uh, culture inspired event and, and have a nose at something they mightn't have seen or experienced before or catch up with friends around a shared pastime or love for uh, bebop or poetry or. Uh, graffiti or any other sort of thing. Uh, on the gaming front, uh, an old stalwart, an old comrade in arms, Wayne O'Connor, hosted a virtual culture night because we are now doing everything virtually. In 2020. Um, I'll just I'll read from the description. As part of Culture Night 2020, members of the Irish Game Club, Sligo Gaming Society, sit down to chat about tabletop gaming, 
their first introductions to the hobby, favorite games, and more. If you want to, to watch the, the video log of this, you can find it on our Stuff From Our Friends thread. Uh, but I just wanted to give Wayne and the Sligo Gamers, whom I've had long uh, and profitable association with, uh, a shout out. They're an absolutely great bunch of folks that are absolutely grassroots gamers. They've done everything from organize cons to charity events to uh, weekly games for uh, for the, the locality. And they've they helped boost the profile of gaming in the West of Ireland for me and for many others. Uh, many years ago and continue to do so today. They've always had a great focus on community and bringing people into the hobby uh, and helping them to find their niche. So, uh, yeah, that's a bit of a shout-out for Culture Night and a shout-out for the Sligo Gaming Society that has spread itself all over the place these days. But uh, thankfully, there's a, a good core of them still down at Sligo. Okay, that's the halftime show over. So, let's get back to the butchering. Okay. Uh, next up is two classics of the 80s, two juggernauts of, of old, uh, old school gaming. Uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the first edition, versus West End Games, seminal D6 based Star Wars. So, who would like to kick us off? Hmm. I'm going to hold fire. Oh, no. Shall I go first? Is it, is it my turn to go I'll first? I'll go okay. first. I'll go first. You go first. Go on. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this is where I was being meta earlier and felt it was okay to vote for Star Wars early because this, at first glance, this was a close matchup for me because these are both giants of their time. Um, uh, first Ed is uh, where the the meat of uh, D&D uh, as a hobby was forged uh, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna stop using bad analogies that it was <laughs> the seminal work of D&D uh, even if as basic D&D which, yes was again I'm sorry I forgot about basic D &D on the list the Gygaxian uh, meat forges what a brilliant image <laughs> um, um, it would have fit in those old adventures coming um, to a magic card near you. <laughs> I mean, they are making uh, D D magic cards uh, mm. next year, so who oh, knows? Don't get me started. Um, Do get me started. West, the Western game Star Wars um, has got this really weird advantage because it was sort of done in the. It, it was begun in the uh, period where the movies were fresh. I think it actually was released the same year as Empire Strikes Back or just like slightly after. It was a seminalist day and also helped kickstart what we now know as the expanded universe. And uh, that's a whole other... That's I'm pretty sure there's, there's several entire podcasts dedicated just to that. Yes. Um, the But yes, these are two classic uh, juggernauts. And if if you were to initially just put them up against each other, I would have been very hard pressed to choose between them. But the fact that I've already voted for a Star Wars game, this voting round, uh, means that I feel the pressure's off uh, hmm. to support Star Wars in general. And thus I can say, I'd be interested in playing uh, a first ed game. You know, as a lark, uh, try some of these old adventures, uh, do a bit of uh, classic Greyhawk. Um, you know, I think I could see myself swatting into that. Whereas with Star Wars, you know, I can go to a, a lot of different rule sets, including the well, well worked out Fantasy Fight Games one. So this is close, for free, but I think I'm going to go with D&D in this one. I'm going to slide in second, then. Is that okay, Gavin? Go ahead. Right. I have about... Uh, I mean, the, yeah, they both stem from a relatively similar time. It it strikes me, uh, as I reflect on this, that AD&D First Edition is the sort of the imaginings and the, the spiralling uh, of Gary Gygax being sort of more or less formalised in uh, this this sort of reiteration of D&D. 
because obviously the A stands for advanced. They'd already had a crack at this and decided what we need here are more rules. Uh, Star Wars D6 is taking the sort of the the nascent imaginings of George Lucas and sort of doing some some solid foundational work to lay a, a bedrock under that universe. Uh, so there's this kind of there's interesting things happening in both those spaces. I have about as much interest in returning to a first edition of D and D as I have in returning to say. Windows 3.1 as an operating system. I appreciate that it did its job in the day, but it's been superseded by so many more things that have essentially done uh, done what needs to be done better, faster, uh, with less fuss in the in the uh, in the the in the meantime. Star Wars D6. Uh, quite fond of it, despite not having had much of a brush for it as a, a system. But as you say, it kicked off the expanded universe. It, it put solid meat on what were kind of slightly shonky uh, bones uh, as a setting. Like I think a lot of what Star Wars is today owes a great debt of gratitude to Star Wars D6. I think a lot of what D&D is today grew out of where it started, but doesn't necessarily have much in common with it anymore, aside from some legacy stats, etc. Uh, certainly in terms of how it what it explores, they're two very different sort of paradigms. It has to be, I cannot stress enough, D&D in the day, the adventure took place in the dungeon. It started at the door of the dungeon, ended at the door of the dungeon. Almost nothing else happened. I have a huge appreciation of that, but I think it's well served today by many, many other games that have followed in the footsteps of the D&Ds. Star Wars D6 uh, improved wildly on what it had to start with. It rose above the ignominy of being a tie-in promotional item for a movie franchise and is deservedly beloved. It also houses one of the great spacefaring campaigns, the Dark Strider campaign, which I had the opportunity to play, revised for... Uh, I, I honestly can't remember what system. I'll stop D20? waffling. Uh, no, we didn't, I don't think we played it. I played under some version of um, one of the other... The, was it the... Or the square ones. It was it was the revised D twenty system, yeah. Anyway, yeah, the one that was a little bit fourth ed, but not quite. Star Wars D six gets my vote. Okay, Gavin. I you know I I agree with you that um, you know much that the the Star Wars RPG has shaped the canon of Star Wars, the extended universe. Much of of, of, of what we know and love about Star Wars actually came from them. And it's very interesting to see that sort of symbiosis uh, the, uh, of, of, of lore and story. But, you know, I, I run d and I run d and 5th edition. And I do find myself going back to d and 1st edition and, you know, looking through those old adventures and, and taking bits and pieces and still using them. And, um, like... I, I can't say that about many other systems that I, I I go back to older editions to try find bits and pieces that I can use and and and, and inspiration from 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 the old and I I'm gonna have to go with D and D here because uh, it, it, legacy aside it, you, there is still much there is so much in the DNA of how role playing games work that if you go back and 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 actually look at it you can still get something from it. And I like um, Shane said, I, I I would I would actually be interested in trying out first edition, seeing what it's like to play through. Um, and and I, I can't say that about really any, uh, most RPGs written so long ago. Wow. Wow. Mm. Well, I'm undone here, folks. I bowed and bloodied on the battlefield. Finally. Someone's done me in. Yeah, I can't. I can't argue with that actually. Although I would say that you're probably better served by things like the Black Hack. Oh yes. If you're looking uh, for the flavor, but don't get uh, don't get Scar started on that. We have an episode uh, to get through. We've <laughs> so, done two episodes. On I that. believe anyway. that goes to AD and D first ed. Yeah. Two one. Okay. Next up, we're returning to from '80s darlings. We go to '90s darlings, as we have hmm. Changeling. Well, the uh, the the dreaming and the lost from uh, Wolf from White Wolf, 
Um, versus a Deadlands, the classic Weird West role playing game uh, from uh, Pinnacle Entertainment. I want to start off here. Go, okay, go go. I love, I love the Wild West. I love cowboys, and I love strange mysteries and um, you know, wild and crazy things happening in that time period. There's a lot that can be explored, a lot that can be uh, done there. And I, I find I, I've actually run a campaign set in the Wild West uh, using um, using sort of supernatural elements in that period. I, I, I love it to death. But I did that in World of Darkness. And World of Darkness is such an interesting world, and, and Changeling specifically... It's such a compelling story that it gives you as I, I fell in love with reading the books when I was first introduced to RPGs. It, it is a world that that has gripped people for so long and, and so much and people have such strong opinions and it, it you playing through it and, and with my experiences, I'm, I'm with Changeling specifically, you know, I, I, I was moved and I was satisfied with the, the story that was presented to me. And it, it's something that I, I would love to come back to, to run a game of my own. I, I, I see Deadlands. I admire what it's done. And it's a hard one. It's a hard one because Deadlands to me represents some very interesting steps forward in, in, in the right direction in terms of uh, games. But it for me, Changeling is is a, a, a wonderful, unique experience that you can't get anywhere else. And and when you play through it, you you, you get a sense of a, a, a wonderful story that um, will change you as a person with the right you know with the right campaign it can really really make you make you feel things. Okay. Um... Think <clears throat> I'm happy to to go on this one. If you uh, if you want to marshal your thoughts, Gar, do you do you have something you want to jump no, in? No, I now? think I've pretty much made my decision already. Right, uh, that's what we all have, haven't we? <laughs> well, that's part of the part of the format. These are both games where their weirdness overcomes a lot of initial reluctance. I have misgivings about the viability of uh, me enjoying World of Darkness games that I found that Changeling is the game that helps me overcome the most because it's dealing with the, a very interesting intersection of normality and fantasy that I think I can uh, work best with as opposed to the int- the slightly grimmer uh, intersection of real life problems plus fantasy horror problems uh, that you get in the likes of Vampire or Werewolf. Deadlands has sort of helps me overcome the monolith of the Western genre uh, and its many, many, uh, its massive um, support and understanding in the Western mythos coupled with its uh, problematic and unspoken elements. Um, to me, the again the fantasy elements and the uh, uh, altering of timelines has really helped make Deadlands more appealing as a way to explore the whole Western aesthetic. So both of these are sort of in my I should I should body up to both of these because they're giving me ins into sections of gaming that otherwise I might not jump into, uh, but. Between the two of them, I gotta say Deadlands is going to take it for me. Changeling is nice and weird and all, but it it's also possibly a bit too weird. Deadlands, I think, squares a circle of matching um, matching the mundanities of a setting with its more fantastical em- elements, and that both breathe better. Whereas Changeling is just seems like you're kind of switching modes a bit too much and it's a difficult feeling to really articulate but it's just I feel like Deadlands has the better marrying of the elements for me to to latch on to it so yeah my vote is for Deadlands I'll stop waffling 
Once in a while, I have to look Hedo one in the eye, and if I <laughs> voted against Deadlands here, I'm not sure I could anymore. But that's uh, that's not why I'm voting for Deadlands. Uh, I th- I th- what you said, Scar, resonates uh, very well with me. They're both weirdos as settings that manage to kind of overcome uh, that weirdness to draw you in. They're both quite compelling. Uh, I think if Changeling had been around uh, at the same time as comic books like Fables and shows like Once Upon a Time, I suspect I'd be uh, I'd be more on side with it. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of came along in the era of Buffy, where ah, yeah. it's the, like it it just it sort of falls into that Teen Wolf kind of monster comedy drama uh, place, and I think. Given that that's when it was around as an RPG, I suspect that's more or less how it got played. Deadlands has a lot of cultural baggage to overcome. It's set post, it's set sort of sort of post or Elon I believe Gates. Is the term. Yeah, but although it, it does in the timeline, it extends the Civil War uh, that decided sort of America's fate. But it's weird enough that it sort of draws you away from the very real political concerns that would have permeated that period and instead invites you into a kind of Lone Ranger versus Zombies uh, alternative universe where you are just free to play out a wildly inventive steampunky Wild West. It doesn't hurt that it it marries some of the 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 artifacts that we so um, associate with Wild West, like a deck of cards mechanically uh, with a uh, with the game itself, I think it's hugely evocative. I think it's it stands almost on its own. Uh, there's very few other games that that occupy the same space. Uh, Changeling has some of that. In fact, the problem is it comes from a stable of games that also put you in the in the role of a, a supernatural entity in sort of the modern world of the '90s. And we'll get to one of those later. But uh, Deadlands is quite, quite singular. It almost has no stablemates. You can go to kind of Weird Wars and, and World War II stuff for a similar taste. But uh, I love its mix of alt history and comic book kind of madness and the mashing up of genres. So I give it to Deadlands in this one. Okay. That looks like it's a 2 1 to Deadlands. Alrighty. And another White Wolf stalwart falls in the line of duty. Is Too actually... many have died. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually okay. is that the last I think that's the last White Wolf thing that was in the lineup. I think um, all, do you all the look others at the, do, you want, do you want to look at the next matchup? <laughs> oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> ah, ah, yes. So yes, spoilers for the next matchup. Uh it is a wizard battle as we have uh the classic troop play uh Zudo medieval um, game Ars Magica versus White Wolf's take on the wizard genre Mage. Uh, sh- I think I need to go first at this point, don't I? I did we ever? D- ah, we never decided. Our- right. I have no idea what to make of Ars Magica. It's uh, it seems a little bit too studied for me. Um, these are both games about um, being a magic user, more or less. Uh, but one of them is set in the period in which magic is kind of the rule of law. Uh, it is the is a fundamental fact of life. The other one, uh, a nineties uh, artifact, where and very much in the Buffy Vampire Slayer mold, or Bewitched. Yeah, let's go with Bewitched for this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. If uh, if you're playing mage and you're watching Bewitched, you were probably having very strange dreams in the nineties. However, Mage stands out for me because it is. A game of warring philosophies. I read it at that point in my life, it was kind of mid teens, 16, 17, read it and ran it, uh, when I was very open to all these different ideas. I was, you know, I had a disinfo.net email account. And I thought we, we, did, we, <clears throat> the Matrix was still in our future, but sim- things like Mage were definitely helping us reach into that future. Ars Magica. It kind of sits alongside Pendragon as being a game for people who want to play in that sort of Authorian mold. It's never really grabbed me. I had an awful lot of fun with Mage. I love the magic system. 
which is incredibly versatile. Uh, it gets broken later on, as so many of White Wolf's systems do, when the dots get a little too high. But for sheer inventiveness, for a, a challenge to players to come up with innovative ways to use their powers to, to, to describe and demonstrate their power in the world while maintaining a sort of a, a quasi-secrecy and always operating under the... Uh, under the edicts of paradox that you can't get too mad with it uh mage i think is just a, a cracking game from the white wolf stable it's one of the weirdly enough one of the more grounded games from that stable because uh, you're playing essentially a human plus hunter comes along later and does a bit of the same but that's that is the buffy the vampire slayer game but mage works for me on, on a number of different levels but but mostly as an, a kind of an entry into modern sort of tribes modern philosophical philosophical musings uh, it had a profound effect on me in that respect and the, the other Ares Magica I can't claim any great knowledge on it uh, it is a dusty old tome of spells whereas Mage is sort of a, a bright and vibrant uh, collection of chaos magic glyphs who's next? I feel like Gavin should go next because yeah, I'm going to be I'm... I'm going to be a problem here I feel <laughs> uh, well, uh, I I'm gonna hop in there and say that Mage is uh, I I I am a fan of the World of Darkness games. Mage is the one that I've dealt with at least partly because I I don't find um, I, as a, a someone running it, I don't find the um, the um, the world, the system, but the system and the setting to be as maybe as player friendly. As some of the other ones, you know, I feel with sort of with Werewolf, with Vampire, with Changing, you have a clear goal and build around as a, um, as, as sort of as players and as a GM, I can sit down, I can, I can imagine some, you know, stories to tell and, and games to run. Whereas with Mage, it's, it's, it's more ephemeral than that. It, it, it sort of, it's, it's quite more larger in, in scope in its ideas that, I find it's more a lot difficult to narrow down, but still, I I find like you said uh, of 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 the world, um, it, it's a very compelling um, philosophical ideas that it deals with, and and sort of gives you as players a lot more freedom to, um, you know, to develop both mechanically and narratively what your character can do. Uh, and and sort of it's very unique in that you know it, there is you know these two <laughs> these two games have a lot in common they have a lot a lot of similarities in 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 how the, how they they operate but but I, I purely for for the, the philosophies behind it and and the the kind of stories that can be run with it I'm gonna have to go with Mage. Okay, damn your problem, Scar. Let's hear what you think. <laughs> So, we have this group of oddly o doing okay in their lives people who are claiming that they are being oppressed by the system and they need to, <laughs> using various subtle methods, uh, bring people around to their way of thinking and cause a great awakening that will sweep away the old order and bring in the true face of humanity and change the world to how it should be. Am I talking about Mage or am I talking about QAnon? <laughs> oh boy, oh, oh we're getting wow. political now. <laughs> ooh, ooh. I, I've been, ever since I first looked through Mage, I have been pretty stalwart on the side of the technocracy. I'm going to be <laughs> brutally honest here. I've never gelled with the Mage and it's very particular form of 90s white privilege. Oh, I know so, so much. Uh, why won't the world listen to me? Nonsense. I, these are, yes, this is very true. These are very similar things. These are games based on the premise of the world not being as common, uh, common modernized, say it is, and what that means. But I have always had way more time for Ars Magica's slower, more competitive thing of exploring what that means of working within that world versus mages I know right everyone else is wrong let's 
break things just to get things to match up with me. It's okay. It's not entirely, you know, a negative thing. You can run a mage game where you are the Awakened and you are actually the good guys. The Technocracy are actually the baby eating monsters that I think they had to write three more supplements to make, to be clear. But to me, I'm, I, I still feel that Ars Magica is going to, uh, be the appeal for me. It's different enough. It works with a setting to, to, it works with its own premise. Uh, to create stories that I'm more interested in and weird and busted as its magic system probably is uh, I, I'm more inclined to try that out than take a bunch of D10s out of my bag and attempt to run through White Wolf so and my entirely biased vote is for Ars Magica okay that's who does that give it to that's uh that's unless someone's changing mage. that's still gonna be mage no no um i'm not i'm i'm holding firm <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to stick with what i know and i do appreciate that uh well look i think there's there's something to be said about your the <laughs> mage exists in a world where someone you know had declared the end of history not long after uh, and how blind it was to to the actual underlying tensions of our world has, has become more and more clear as time progresses you know if we want to get political but uh i can i kind of just appreciate it for i think it's the metaphor is perhaps too blunt but i do like the fact that it puts these warring philosophies about the nature of reality mm -hmm. up against each other and invites you it has to have a bad guy, I suppose, for the purpose of running, a, of making stories. But it does really, later on, invites you to simply regard the technocracy as another um, struggling viewpoint. And, and later becomes a grounded reality, which perhaps uh, concedes the entire argument. But uh, yeah, let's let's move on. I, I suppose I do need to know a bit more about ours, Magica, to understand just why I'm being unfair. No, no, it, last, it's last one, last one. Okay, last one. We have one last matchup for today. You know, because you know we need to waste another hour and a half of your life, uh, gentle <laughs> viewers. Um, this time, we are up against uh, the superhero D twenty RPG mutants and masterminds, and it is up against a newcomer, the weird arted, uh, eclectic mech RPG Lancer, which only just got in. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, Savage passion. just sneaking it in at the very end. Lots of passion! <laughs> what can I say? I'm a sucker for a good art style. Um, will, I, will I kick off? I'll kick off. Might as well. I have had to revise my opinion about a few of the games in this list since we last talked. And the, the better I've got to know Lancer, I've made a point of getting to know it better the more conflicted I now am about Lancer. But uh, we'll, we'll turn to Mutants and Masterminds first. It is one of a very small stable of um, hero or, or superhero RPGs. It is, uh, it's pretty straight up. It wants you to play a four-color DC Marvel superhero. And the system it, it presents to do that with, it's kind of a, a build-your-own points by if i recall correctly it does it very well it allows you to produce a carbon copy of a beloved superhero that you're fond of or it allows you to sort of go off on a tangent and, and kind of stick a few things together and as long as you can stay within budget you can do what you're going to do it's fine uh, lancer also comes from a, a stable of fair a fairly small stable of mecha rpgs a uh, sort of mobile fighting suit RPGs, bipedal uh, things. We are we live in an age where I think we're nearly post superhero at this point. Twenty twenty one will get us back on track for cinema releases, and we'll have more of the Marvel stuff. But what it's going to have to do now is start to tell interesting genre stories inside of the bubble of superheroes, um, with the exception of something like Pacific Rim. We haven't had uh, we haven't had a real breakout in the, the common culture, the wider culture, for giant fighting robots. Well explored in anime comic books, but very few movies that really uh, take hold of it as a as an idea and run with it. 
what am I trying to say here? I need to talk about Lancer as a setting, quite like the system. Um, it's an excellent sort of chassis plus bolt-on bits, quite similar to Fourth Ed, ironically enough. Uh, but I think it does it a lot better. And as it presents its action, it's a moment-to-moment uh, f- fighting fest of madness and uh, and ablative mech limbs. You're fighting down to the chassis if you're doing it right. The problem I have is with the setting. The setting as presented is quite convoluted. It's very long. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It is steeped in lore, which gives you lots to chew over, but also in very broad strokes. It's very, very, very politically opinionated. And I, you know, I'm not going to lay out my hobby horses here and now because politics is, is one of those predilections that everyone has their, their point of view and the things that they love to do uh, behind closed doors. But as I read it, it just struck me that this is a very preachy game. It has a worldview that it believes is it's completely right. There really isn't any wriggle room. You're either on the side of what is seen as objectively right in this universe, or you're, you're a bad guy that needs to be gently reformed or maybe have a few giant robots dropped on you. That kind of stuck in my craw, despite the fact that I found myself largely aligned with what Lancer's saying, I found it odd to find it said so bluntly in a in an RPG setting, in a setting book. Mutants and Masterminds remains relatively apolitical. There's a... there. It, it cleaves to notions of right and justice and honor and being the good guy i'm sure you can play blackguards and anti-heroes and mutants masterminds you know, the, uh, the winter soldiers that we've become so fond of as we twist and turn the superhero setting but it it's four color uh, stalwart captain america style stuff you're on the side of right and goodness and the American or, you know, whatever upstanding democracy you, you happen to find yourself in way. So I find myself entirely conflicted. I have championed Lancer and I really like the art style. It's a system I'll use. I'll probably discard the setting. I'm still going to give it to Lancer though. I mm-hmm. think there's there's huge space to explore in it. Um weirdly enough I think it might deliver the best Destiny role playing game we've <laughs> we've seen hints of yet because if you scale if you scale it down in terms of what you're describing anything mechanically could be used to describe the equipment you might equip to your superhero style guardian so you can be a superhero and you can be a superhero in a sort of a, a weird universe that's full of opportunities uh, you may or may not disagree with the politics and you can sort of pick and choose from what they what they offer but uh, I think there's still plenty of meat in the bones Mutants and Masterminds is I'm kind of over superheroes I do want to play Lancer though okay I'll shut up now uh, Gavin are you going on now or will you let another mech head have his bit uh, go ahead I I'm I I, I went into this um, without a, a, an opinion and I'm formulating one but I would love to hear um, hear from uh, Scar, noted lover of giant robots. Fair. I'm not afraid to admit I've been a little bit sceptical of Lancer as it came out. Partly because of the art style just being so loud. Not loud. Busy. Like, it's one of those art styles where you could look at any square inch of a piece of it and just find fractal amounts of weird gubbins panel hatching and like an entire chapter of lore on the goblins that dwell in the joints of the Hades Horus 3XO murder machine. It's not so much intimidating as it always, it definitely feels like it wants to be its, its own thing. Like, like you are you're not playing the mecha game. You are playing Lancer, capital L. Um, and that's it's not a huge demerit for me because like 
mecha is mecha, but I I am still, you know, I still hold to the naive and use fruitless hope that someday the perfect gem- generic mecha system will come along and, you know, let me play any genre I want. I have to contrast, though, with my experiences with Mutants and Masterminds, which is as this sort of creation engine. They pick any uh, pick any hero, character, superhero, cartoon, whatever you make, and try to build them in Mutants and Masterminds. And you'll definitely be able to approximate your 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 hero of choice in the system, maybe even with the amount of points that you said you would, you probably won't be as good as someone who just takes, you know, the right power rank of laser blast plus drain stats or something. To me, Mutes and Masterminds' greatest weakness is as... And it shares this with an awful lot of the superhero RPGs that it uh, is an uh, iteration of. Like, I certainly go to... Uh, Mr. Masterminds before I go to Hero or the like. But it it's one of those systems where balance is sort of something you sort of have to construct as you're constructing your your own avatar. It is it is something that is enforced upon a game by a concerned GM who would rather not let you play a Blitero, the man who atomizes everything within five square miles uh, every every microsecond. I appreciate Mutant Masterminds for what it is, and if I really had a superhero concept I want to run that couldn't be played by something more modern like masks, then yeah, I could see myself use, uh, telling people to construct um, something using using it and we'll then like do a couple of editing passes on these characters to make sure that they're not just going to destroy the universe um but with lancer it's not about having to put in more efforts simply about having to compromise it's having to accept a system of a certain style and a presumably work with this not objectionable but very clearly loud and proud setting and honestly between the mutants masterminds i know and the lancer i've only looked at i'd be what more likely to go to uh lancer and uh try it out than go back into the number mines of mutants masterminds and try to pull something out of it well <laughs> you could knock me down with a feather <laughs> okay now this could be the uh, Zoomer role player in me, but I think it's important that as role playing games progress and as they become more developed, that we are able to expand what role play games we write and and the stories that we tell and the games we play, and and you can create extremely bespoke experiences. You know, there are systems that are designed like you know fifth edition like, you know, um, Savage Worlds, um, to tell very generic stories and to be able to be used for different kinds of stories. And then there's some extremely specific RPGs. And I think that, you know, the specificity of an RPG, like, for example, Dogs in the Vineyard is a perfect example. You are playing a very specific character in a very specific world, playing very specific things. I... and. I, there was sort of made mention of that in the previous um, fight that mage is, is a story you know you're not playing you're not playing the unequivocal good guys and I think it's important that RPGs like any art form you know tell those stories of you know everything isn't necessarily black and white or everything isn't necessarily shades of gray you know it can be orange and blue you know different sides of an argument that you know may or may not be right i i don't know lancer i don't know what the the story they're peddling and certainly there's a few sacred cows when it comes to politics in role-playing games and politics in any media that that you know that should be kept but i think it's important that the interesting stories are, are told but i think it's like what what is making me pick lancer is your descriptions of it and descriptions of mutant masterminds 
I now want to play Lancer. I want to. I now want to sit down and you know, m- you know, work on on this mech and 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 you know, manage manage this 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 piloting this thing. I want to see what the system is like. I want to see what this world is like. I may disagree with what's being said in it, but I think that that is what what's pushing me over into choosing Lancer. Is it just seems interesting to me and intriguing to me, and 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 like it's a good thing that it exists, whether or not it's a good game. Well, then, seems that uh, the young oh. Hummer still has some <laughs> kick in her yet. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've been keeping track. Uh, so this session, we've had one, two, three clean sweeps uh, mm-hmm. going to Star Wars FFG, Savage Worlds, and lastly, Lancer. Everything yep. else has been contested to one. And yep. That is the nature of the bracket fight. Gavin, we are crawling up on the hour 24 mark. Why don't you take us out? Okay. Let's just go and lick our wounds after this bruising melee. <laughs> they, they speak to the glory of combat, the glory of fight, but the true cost is to the person. I feel changed by this. Some some things that are, are, are I believe, to have been changed. and Some beliefs I've had about these games are even more affirmed by uh, those denying it but um I, I i look forward and i i hope you all do to seeing just how it whittles down um to the final fight um my final thoughts and and i hope everyone's final thoughts is that it just shows that there are so many different games and so many different ranges of stuff that um you know and there's different viewpoints in them that's the wonderful thing about rpgs they're so different uh before i i collapse from 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 this hard fought battle um, uh, I wish to, you know, thank my, my my fellow fellow fighters in this battle, and say to you all that um, this party's over. Thanks for listening to the Adventure Party. You can find show notes and links to things we've mentioned at www.theadventuringparty.net and on our Facebook page. You can leave comments there. Or talk to our Twitter account at AdventurePTY. Or you can record a voice message at www.speaktype.com slash the adventure party. We can also be contacted directly by email at party at the If you'd like to be in touch with the party all the time, come join our Discord server. Link in the show notes. The Adventure Party is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike of Version 3 License.